similar versions of this lecture appear in my other courses, Editing Your Own Work and Writing Comics, so if you've seen either, feel free to skip this part. Anyway, as of this 2022 recording, for the last eight years, I've been teaching writing for a living online through the University of Massachusetts. And during that time, I've read hundreds of queries written by students, some amazing, some more obviously from people just starting out. Here I want to look at what I've come to see as the biggest stumbling block for beginners and old hands alike, not only in writing summaries, but for writing in general. That is, as you may have guessed from the title, redundancy. Here I'll discuss the three types of redundancy, how to spot them, and some situations in which redundancy can actually be useful. So I'm serious about this. Totally serious. Absolutely, totally serious. You see what I did there? Two words, I'm serious, would have sufficed. For that matter, why say it at all? Don't you assume I'm serious? So, what is redundancy? The Macmillan Online Dictionary defines it as a situation in which something is not needed, especially because the same thing or a similar thing already exists. What's wrong with it? Well, as the talking heads say in Psycho Killer, say something once, why say it again? Needless repetition not only ruins flow, it's a quick way to dispel writing's grand illusion, reminding readers that they're staring at mere words and not experiencing a world. In summaries and one-page queries, they eat up space that could be put to much better use. But repetition comes naturally for most. As we write, we search for the right word or phrase. Often more than one comes to mind, and in the creative rush of a first draft, we tend to use them all. To be clear, repetition does have legitimate uses. There are times you want to remind your readers about something, for instance, or create a stylistic rhythm. More on both later, but it's crucial that it be used consciously, never as an abdication of effort. Now, redundancy is often thought of as mere word repetition, as in the famed Department of Redundancy Department joke, which I once thought was from Monty Python, but is actually from Firesign Theater. Your food, housing, insecurity will be guaranteed by your Department of Redundancy Department and the Natural Guards. But it can be more than that, operating on different levels. To address them all, I split the concept into three categories. No doubt others have had similar ideas, but I've never seen them set out in quite this way. Using alliteration to make them easier to remember, they are a core redundancy, conceptual redundancy, and contextual redundancy. A core redundancy refers to basic word repetition, as in the fire sign theater joke. Core redundancy can also easily be confused with a similar issue, overuse. The repetitive use of a word or phrase can have a similar effect and should likewise be avoided. But unlike redundancy, the information conveyed isn't a repetition. For instance, the cat was small, small, small is a redundancy. The cat was small, the dog was small, the tree was small, and the house was small is overuse. In the first case, yes, we get it, the cat's small. The repetition does provide a rhythm which may be useful, but it doesn't give us anything new. But in the second case, telling us the cat was small is different from telling us the dog was small. Still, hearing the same word over and over can get annoying fast, largely because it reminds us we're looking at a word. A more efficient but less rhythmic way of saying the same thing would be the cat, dog, tree, and house were all small. In the short space of a one-page query, core redundancy and overuse are easy to spot and eliminate, provided you're looking for them. In a completed work, though, overuse can be much more difficult to weed out. A particular word or phrase which may have been perfect the first time can quickly become tedious for the reader. Tracking them among the 90,000 words of a manuscript isn't easy. The best way to deal with that is to keep a list of suspect words and phrases. When you're proofing, enter them in your word processor search feature. That'll not only find them, it'll count how many times you've actually used them. While core redundancies and overuse involve identical words or phrases, in a conceptual redundancy, different words are used to describe the same thing. Ergo, the shortest a core redundancy can be is two words. In that form, they're well known, and many delightful lists of common redundancies can be found online. A few examples include cease and desist, collaborate in groups, gather together, and absolutely essential. Conceptual redundancies can be tougher to spot, partly because they're used so often informally, they feel natural. As a result, my students will sometimes argue that some or all of these aren't redundant, but they are. To cease is to desist. You can't collaborate without a group. To gather is to bring together. And something is either essential or it's not, meaning that if it's essential, it's already absolutely essential. 
Essential, non-essential. Those are the choices. Likewise, absolutely true or absolutely pregnant. It's understandable. Many sound more like a way of emphasizing something rather than repeating it. To cease and desist sounds much more important than just ceasing or desisting. The most difficult to spot, though, are those that go beyond these word-to-word -word correlations. The trickier conceptual redundancies can include multiple sentences or even paragraphs, such as, tears flowed freely from Martin's eyes. He was crying. Why redundant? We already know Martin's crying because of the tears. Or, the dog pushed its legs hard, moving as fast as it could. It was running. If the dog is pushing its legs hard, moving as fast as it can, of course it's running. That's what running is. These examples, I hope, are obvious, intended to get the idea across clearly. In practice, it can be much tougher. At the same time, in conceptual redundancies, at least we're still dealing with words. That's not true of contextual redundancies, where the information is needlessly repeated because the situation or context has already made it clear. How many of us have received emails that begin, I'm writing to you today? If you're writing to someone, of course you're writing. And when else would you be writing if not on the day that you're writing? Likewise, when writing a query, consider the situation. If you're contacting a fiction editor about your work, context alone already tells them three things. A, that you're writing, B, that you're writing about a novel, and C, that the novel is yours. Yet I often see queries opening with phrases like, I'm writing to tell you about my fiction novel, which tells the tale. Now, how much of that should you keep? None. It's not only all apparent from the context, it takes up valuable space that could be used, for instance, for your content description. And by the way, aside from the contextual redundancy, this example also contains two conceptual redundancies. Can you spot them? Time's up. A novel, by definition, is fiction. That, of course, tells, or one hopes shows, a tale. And since contextual redundancy doesn't involve other words, you may not consider it a redundancy at all. Even so, whether you need to cut just one more line to fit your query into a page, or you want your prose to be as smooth and streamlined as possible, or even if you want additional clarity in organizing your innermost thoughts, eliminating them can be incredibly useful. And speaking of usefulness, while I firmly believe that redundancy in all its forms is a devious obstacle to good writing, when used intentionally, it can be a powerful tool. As I said earlier, there are times when you want to remind the reader of something, as I did just now, where I repeated myself to let you know that we're now returning to a previously mentioned topic. Likewise, in longer works, it can be important to touch back on a plot point, especially if that point was introduced a few hundred pages back. Good thing I took the bullets out of that gun back in Cincinnati. Redundancy can also be used for dramatic effect. He's dead, Jim. Dead. Lastly, repetition can be used to enhance aesthetic flow, the rhythms of dialogue, or the poetics of a descriptive passage. Take this example from The Bells by Edgar Allan Poe, which repeats time and bells to great effect. All the heavens seem to twinkle with a crystalline delight, keeping time, time, time in a sort of runic rhyme to the tintinabulation that so musically wells from the bells, 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 bells from the jingling and the tingling of the bells. Here, the repetition of bells conveys and conjures the sound itself. The point again is to use it consciously, and the only way to do that is to scour your writing for any of the three forms of redundancy. If you find one you want to keep, make sure you have a great ironclad reason. Otherwise, delete it ruthlessly. And there you have it. I hope these lectures prove useful to you. Feel free to post your own query efforts as well as any questions. And thanks for watching.